I am going to talk a little bit about the project itself, but mostly about creating change with uh, stories. Um, and this is our new poster. Uh, so this is a long night. Um, it looks at domestic minor sex trafficking here in the Seattle area. Um, and you know, I started a while ago uh, looking at stories as, as a means of having experience and enjoying things, um, I guess being a voyeur, if you will. Uh, and it wasn't until maybe 15 years ago when I was looking at sexual violence and realized how prevalent it was in my community and actually in every community that I started to see how it's possible to create change, to engage audiences and help them see what they can do to make a difference. And, and since then, every project that I've embarked on has had some element of, of that. So I'm just going to show you the first three minutes of the film here. It kind of introduces the characters and will give you an idea of the work. Before she left, I woke up in the middle of the night to her screaming, help me, daddy, help me. I ran to her room and she was throwing up. So I helped her and she was okay after that. After she was gone, I, there wasn't anything I could do. I couldn't get that out of my head. Still can't. I got a, a phone call from the local PD asking for dental records. When you have a child that's missing, you can only assume that they're trying to ID a body. A lot of cops, you know, especially when they're young, are adrenaline junkies. In my case, doing the undercover to pretend to be something you're not and getting paid for it. That's what you become a cop for, is all that excitement. It's been 12 years for me in street crimes. It's a lot to try to deal with mentally. You can't bring it home. A lot of cops will be jaded within the first three or four years. You deal with a specific segment of society that pretty much hates you, and you get that day in and day out. I was 15. I should have experienced a childhood, my teenage years, my high school years. I should have been going to football games. But instead, I was so sure that I was in love with this 32-year-old pimp. I just didn't know what was real anymore. I was living under bridges. I was intrigued by doing something so simple and having whatever you wanted. Um, so this was uh, funded in part by the Alexia Foundation. Uh, they're out of Syracuse University, and I applied for their inaugural Women's Initiative grant uh, in 2012. Before that, I had spent four years researching, building relationships, and uh, writing grants to try and fund this project. And that initial grant uh, gave me $25,000, which is just enough to get you in trouble uh, six months of living expenses for me. I, I don't require a lot. Um, but by the time those six months were up, I had enough relationship and access and had been shooting enough video at that point that I had to carry on. So I ended up putting in my own savings, going into debt, uh, just to see this through to the end of the filming part. Um, the Blue Earth Alliance, who I'm here speaking for, uh, is another one of my partners. Uh, they provide the ability for me to go after foundation grants, and they're part of a community of photojournalists, uh, as you've seen today, uh, dedicated to telling stories that create change. Um, 
It also allowed me to work with the uh, fledgling fund. Um, they support a number of important films. Uh, they, they help with the impact campaign part. And so when I finished doing the film, the filming of it in 2013, and we had a rough cut and we started, um, I should say, I started uh, looking at grassroots distribution and partnership in 2014. So since the end of 2013, I've been working on that impact campaign and the fledgling fund has been part of that. I should also note that the Alexia Foundation is hosting a seminar on November 6th at the International Center for Photography in New York City, uh, where we'll be talking about photography as an agent for change. And I am bringing the fledgling fund there uh, as part of my presentation, and then also they'll be participating in a review later in the day. Uh, definitely, if you want to learn about making change with your work, that's going to be a good thing to go to as well. And then finally, MediaStorm. Uh, the Alexia Foundation hired MediaStorm to do the uh, editing of a multimedia piece. That turned into the film because of the access that I had. And uh, it, you know, I could not have edited this piece myself. So really, it's Tim McLaughlin, the editor, and then Joe Fuller added motion graphics to help cover some of the stuff that was uh, looking back into the past that I did not have B-roll for. Did an amazing job with that. Um, so what am I actually trying to do here? I've got a social justice issue. I've got a short photography project that all of a sudden turns into this feature length documentary film. And right then and there, I could be like, sweet, I'm done. I've made this amazing piece. And uh, oh, by the way, uh, I won awards this year, 2015 World Press, Pictures of the Year, National Press uh, Photographers Association, Best of Pictures, um, Webby nomination, uh, DART award finalist. That's great, I can rest on my laurels, right? Well, no, because I'm telling this story to try and create some sort of change. So I'm looking at grassroots distribution, and I'm looking at policymaker engagement program, which I'll talk about what they are. But together, they joined to create you know, this, this movement. You know, it's taking this movie and turning it into a movement. Grassroots, I believe, is how this works, because this is a difficult subject. Brands do not want to touch it. I've been looking for sponsorship. I'm happy to accept sponsorship, but people don't want to touch this issue because it's a little too dark. That pisses me off. But there's an audience out there that is committed to this. It's a niche audience, but they care about this issue passionately, and they're willing to engage in it. And so that's where I think grassroots distribution is really important, especially to stories that really matter. Um, you know, the, uh, the Long Night movie is the face, I uh, say, the Facebook page is Movie the Long Night. And I think we had fewer than 500 followers at the time that we launched this, uh, December 2014. This is the kind of reach that it had, 97,000. Shares of 753 in the first week, the Vimeo had 8,000 plays. Uh, I was able to work with, uh, Social Good Moms on Twitter, at Social Good Moms and they spread it out, getting a million reach through their Twitter following. Uh, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children picked it up and shared it off of their Facebook for another several hundred plays. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's going out to where that audience is and, and reaching them, but it's a movie, and movies, you know, people like to come to a theater and experience that live event and that community and be there. So I went to Central Cinema here in Seattle, which is a great venue. Uh, 120 seats, sold it out, had to turn people away at the door. Um, but it gave me the opportunity to say thank you to the people that I know in the community and meet some of the people that, that I haven't had a chance to interact with and have a live event. Also working with mainstream media. Um, this is Time Lightbox featuring MSNBC's piece that we did on one of the characters from the film, uh, Lisa. Uh, also ended up uh, with uh, New York Times Lens blog. Uh, Huffington Post did it twice with uh, David Ryder and Claire to Topalian, uh, who are both local contributors to Huffington Post. Um, Pixel Project, uh, Imaho Magazine, uh, Photo District News. I mean, it's, it's trying to get this out into as many channels as possible because you want to cast that net wide to get your story out there. Kickstarter. Does anybody here actually run a Kickstarter? Um, they're really kind of a pain, but what I like about them is that it is building community and it allows you to monetize that community. What's also interesting is that a lot of the people who contributed to my Kickstarter campaign didn't ask for a reward. 
They didn't really want something. They wanted to contribute. They wanted to do something for this. And what that something was, was to take the film from this online platform and get it into physical media and other means so that you know, I, could, I could get it out to a, an even broader audience. One of those things is uh, DVD and Blu-ray. I had no idea how to do this stuff uh, before. Um, but especially Blu-ray. I mean, when I, when I did my last DVD off of my home computer, uh, Blu-ray didn't even exist. So I had to learn about that. But now we've got uh, the DVDs are being made right now, and those are going to go out to individuals, but they're also being included in library collections. Um, tomorrow night I'm going to be speaking at, at a Snow Isle um, event, uh, the county north of here and they're going to take a copy of the DVD, put it into their collection, and then also include it as a screening series throughout their branch libraries. And then, I uh, forget when Kansas City is, um, early December, but we could do the same thing with Kansas City Library System as well. Again, that's getting the film and the story and the media out there. Um, Gather is another thing. This is a crowdsourced uh, uh, theatrical on-demand platform. And what that means is that any individual can say, I want to see this film and I want to create an event around this. So I'm going to go to the Gather platform and, or the, the, the movie's website, uh, thelongnightmovie.com. Uh, it's not ready yet. I'm working on it. <laughs> but uh, you can go there and say, I want to create this event at my local theater, be it a Regal Cinema or a Landmark or whatever. And that individual becomes the captain and they create this social event where they bring people together and share the film. And what's cool about it is that they can do a Q&A, they can host a panel discussion, they can treat it as a fundraiser for the local homeless youth shelter or whatever. Uh, what it does is it gives the power of that film to the audience to do something with it, to create awareness, to build a movement. Also, I think when we're talking about journalism, I think it's important to be transparent. Uh, this is my piece on Vantage, which is on the Medium platform. And this was, uh, uh, what, what is that, March 15 or something like that. And this is when it went up. Um, apparently this is, this is pretty good for a 13 minute read because people have to commit 13 minutes to reading it. 19% read through it, which is not bad from what I understand. Uh, but more importantly, that niche audience was able to grab onto it. I think one of the reasons I'm here today is because of that piece. Also, World Press Photo created a panel discussion at the awards ceremony uh, because of this piece, and they had me on that to, to speak about this. So I think getting it out to all these different places again, you know, forgetting about silos, just going and pushing it out there, getting your story out is important. It's taking it to the audience. Don't make them come to you, go to them. Who is that audience? In my case, it's domestic minor sex trafficking, and it's a whole ecosystem. You're looking at root causes like homelessness or sexual violence or poverty, but then there's some solutions that might be found in the criminal justice system or through drop-in centers. Uh, the foster system needs to be engaged. Um, media, you know, we're part of that too. So that is the audience. It's these, these silos, these organizations, but they're made up of individuals, and individuals need emotion. So I think that if you can hit them with an emotional story that has a universal theme, a character-driven narrative, and provides agency, then I think you have a chance to make an impact. You can't just say, oh, here's this horrible thing, and now I hope that um, once you've seen my stuff, uh, change will happen. It, it, it doesn't work that way. And even giving people hope, like hope is empty. Hope is what you have when there is nothing but agency, provide them with something that they can do. That's where you're gonna get them engaged. So again, I've got this story, but the story does not equal change because the emotions, they need a place to go. So you gotta develop this landing place. Is that up to the photojournalist to do? Maybe, like in my case, I do have a bit of a nonprofit background, so I understand a little bit more about this, but looking at partnership would be good too. Once you have that landing place, you know, in my case, I'm turning this movie into a movement, and then that movement goes into a box, which means it can be replicated, which means it can be scaled, which means it can create change on a national scale. So for me, that landing place is Leaving the Life, which is a sorely neglected website built on Squarespace, very simple, easy to do. 
Um, it's a Facebook page, it's a Twitter account, it's an Instagram at Leaving the Life. And they've all been neglected as I've been trying to build this thing around the film because it's me and a couple of volunteers. So in the meanwhile, this is the holding place. But what's in that holding place is this thing which is Harvest. And I've partnered with the fourth act, which is down in Portland. Um, and they have this mobile application that allows you to measure the audience's reaction in real time and then feed it back to them afterwards. And so what you're seeing here is positive reactions above the line, negative reactions below the line, and then these themes that are kind of keyworded or you know, marked on the timeline. And uh, there's a video here for it that hopefully will work. So these are the thumbnails from this short chapter pulled out of the raw content of the film. It's themed, and it's meant to create um, you know, moments of conflict within the audience. And then we're able to separate them out by user groups as they've identified. And then these themes like victim-centric or this, this blue one, traditional mentality. As we separate that one out, you're going to see that the cops didn't really have a problem with this traditional mentality around law enforcement, but the service providers, the victim services people did. They had a huge problem with it. And what was happening in that moment was a young woman was handcuffed and there was a cop standing over her. For service providers looking at that, they're going to say that is not victim-centric. But cops are going to look at that and say, that's safety. That's us controlling the situation. This is standard operating procedure because it's my safety that I'm worried about. So what this does is prevent, presents a place where we can have a discussion around this issue. We can have you know, this um, facilitated, let's see if this works, there we go, facilitate and co-create solutions. And that becomes this catalyst for change with that group. And so the organization walks out with a call to action and the individuals in that organization walk out with a call to action. This is not possible though without, um, oh, that was the next slide, here's this slide. Right. Well, there's the diagram of kind of how it works. The film over here, um, screenings local and national, we found that they create a great place for broad audience engagement where you can bring in the general public plus the policymakers and the experts. But then for those policymakers and experts, we do the engagement program. Like for instance, here in King County, we're working towards this. And then the Center for Children and Youth Justice, which is here in Seattle, they work with stakeholders around the, the state um, on task forces. And so we can, we can replicate it out there. That all feeds into this uh, movement in a box, which then we can scale. Um, so again, this is not possible without partnership. And this image here is not a good one. It's off my iPhone. It's processed through Instagram. And I shot it last Tuesday at Perkins Coie, which is a law firm here in Seattle. Seated here is a senior deputy prosecuting attorney for King County who handles most of the uh, domestic minor sex trafficking cases. Standing is Dow Constantine, our county executive. Val Ritchie, seated, he said a year ago over coffee, he's like, wouldn't it be cool if King County had this policy as, as an entity that said, uh, you know, this is how we're going to deal with the buying of sex using county time, resources, property, equipment, etc. You know, these are the penalties people are going to look at. Um, it's taken a year for that to happen, but here's Dow standing up and saying, these are King County's new policies. This is what we're going to do as an organization. And we're doing this with 18 different businesses across the nation. And we are the you know, founding members of this BEST Alliance. And the BEST Alliance is one of the local nonprofits that is working around this issue and educating businesses. So um, my film helped the people who make these policies get to the point to be able to do this, which is super cool. Um, anyhow, if you have any questions, Tim at TimMatsui.com or at me at TimMatsui, please follow on the socials for the film, help build out Leaving the Life, and uh, thank you very much for your time. Go make something important.